Hello everyone and welcome to another masterclass as a part of the Berkshires High Peaks Festival. My name is Carolyn Regula and I will be hosting today's class. The Berkshires High Peaks Festival is a part of Close Encounters with Music. And the mission of Close Encounters with Music is to engage the imagination of diverse concert audiences in a welcoming setting to connect listeners to performers and composers and foster the excitement and sense of community that live performance builds. To establish a comfortable listening environment and to turn performances into enriching educational and uplifting experiences. I will be including a donation link in the chat window below if you would like to consider supporting Close Encounters with Music and our ongoing festival. You can also use this chat window to talk amongst yourselves during today's masterclass. If you have a question for our instructor, Professor Elliot Fisk, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. So all of our classes are recorded as always and will be available to view later on the Close Encounters with Music YouTube channel. So today I am so delighted that you are all going to see three of our guitarist participants. The guitar program is a new concept to the Berkshires High Peaks Festival and you guys are in for a treat. I I feel lucky I get to hear students ahead of time for these sound checks and they all sound absolutely wonderful. And today they are going to be working with our guitar faculty member, Elliot Fisk. Elliot Fisk is a prolific recording artist and is known very well for his transcriptions, including his entire transcription of all six Bach cello suites. He has appeared as a soloist with many orchestras, including the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the Houston Symphony, the Rochester Symphony, the American Composers Orchestra, and many others. Currently, Elliot Fisk is on faculty at Boston's New England Conservatory, where in 2010, he received the Krosner Award as Teacher of the Year. So without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Elliot Fisk, and I hope you all enjoy today's masterclass. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. Um, it's an honor to participate with so many distinguished colleagues from around the world and to enjoy the performances of the marvelous young people who uh, really give the festival so much spark and life. So just as a, an outline of what, what's to come today, uh, the three guitarists beginning with Thatcher Harrison and Carmine Catalano from Italy, and finally with Yong Heon An, who will be joining us from Korea. Um, we're going to basically do a Paganini sandwich, which means we're having Bach as, as the outside frame for the uh, performances. We will begin with, uh, I'm not sure if we'll do both of the first two movements of the Bach Cello Suite, number six in D major, Bach Verge Verzeichnis 1012, or probably concentrate more on the Almond, because Thatcher was privileged to have a an individual lesson with Maestro Yehuda Hanani, my dear brother and friend, on the on the uh, prelude. So perhaps we'll focus today more on the Almond. That will be followed by Carmine Catalano, who will play the Capriccio number six by Niccolò Paganini, in a guitar transcription that I made. And finally, uh, uh, Yong Heon An will join us with one or two of the first two movements of the Bach C major violin sonata, Bach Verge Verzeichnis 1005. So, uh, Thatcher, do you hear me? And if you do, would you like to start us off? And if so, what would you like to start us off with? It would be my pleasure. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello, everyone. My name is Thatcher Harrison. Uh, today, uh, I will be performing the first two movements, the Prelude and the Allemande, from my own arrangement of the Cello Suite Number no. Six, BWV One Thousand Twelve, composed by Johann Sebastian Bach. <laughs> Thank you. 
Excuse me, Thatcher. It's, excuse me. It's terrific playing. Um, I'm just going to interrupt in the interest of time because we, we're, we're rather limited in trying to fit three people into, into two hours. But um, in, in general, terrific. Um, in the in the prelude, I know you worked on it with uh, Maestro Yehuda, so I'm not I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on it. Um, uh, when we have chance to to look at at uh, at this piece again uh, individually, we'll work on on some of the some of the things in in there that maybe we could still um, improve. But it sounds terrific in general. I would just caution when you have when you have this theme. First of all, let me get in tune with you. Where are you? No idea. Well, give me your E string. Give me your top string. The opening. Uh, wait, you know, those, I think that I think of this as being uh, horns, maybe natural horns. So. You don't want to you don't want to you don't want to accent the third beat of the three. You know, when sometimes when you came back to that after the cadenza, you were for my ear accenting a little bit too much the third beat of the of the of the three eighth notes. So make sure it, it to me this is sort of like a a natural uh, horn you know in the old style horn. Just trying out the, you know, the, the 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 tonic, the third, the fifth, and the octave, right? Uh, so I, I want to hear body, 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 body. Sort of it's like it almost has a hunting horn kind of kind of feeling to it. Um, sure. And when when in considering the cadenza, I think uh, you don't have to be perhaps in such a hurry. And if you want a model for this cadenza in the same key. Is the Brandenburg Concerto Five the tremendous harpsichord concerto in there? You know, if you want, if you want to know about Bach, of course you can read about his. You can read his contemporaries, you know, such as Kvans and or his son's marvelous book, Philipp Emanuel Bach's Versuch, uh, you know, his piano keyboard method, which has a lot about music in it as well. Um, but really, the best source on Bach, on Johann Sebastian Bach, is his own music. So the more of his music you know, the better uh, you equipped you are to understand any particular piece. Um, so that's I, I would say as far as you know, trying to locate the your idea of the cadenza, and it really is a cadenza. Uh, you know that if you listen to the Fifth Brandenburg again and hear what he does, it's almost the, he almost starts it almost the same way. You know, and and of course that's one of the that's probably the wildest craziest cadenza. Maybe in the history of music, it's 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 a marvelous thing. So I think there it, it's good to have you know some freedom in the cadenza, but the cellists sometimes take even a quicker tempo than what you. I thought your tempo was right on. I think just exactly right. But cellists, I've heard them really go fast, and I've had a lot of discussions uh, sometimes with you know peer, people who really specialize in early music about it. And, and I say, well, if you go that fast, then your cadenza, you know, you, you take another tempo for the cadenza and. Some of the early music people are, in fact, even in favor of that. And people are all over the block on how to how to how to uh, you know try to understand Bach, but he's sort of like, like Mount Everest. You know, we go up and down, we go up and down, but Mount Everest stays there. You know, <laughs> they're all of us. We're we're clamoring all over. All of us clamoring all over uh, Mount Everest, and some of us, you know, think we've we've. Uh, discovered the ultimate wisdom on Bach and 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 yet he kind of remains you know I I immutable and and it's it's up to us to do do our to do our best to try to try to uh, approach him I would like to say about the cello suites in general just a few words and, and just a few words about Bach's solo compositions for solo instruments which begin about uh 995 Bach Wecker Verzeichnis 995 with the only manuscript that we have from Bach's own hand of any of the cello suites, which is namely his lute transcription of the fifth suite. Uh, that he calls pièce pour la lute, pieces for the lute. And he transposed it a fifth to G minor and uh, uses the whole range of the Baroque lute, which goes down to the A below the cello's C string. Uh, in fact, Bach calls for a G below that A, so perhaps that means he wanted the bottom course of the 13 course Baroque lute tuned down a step. 
Anyway, it's very interesting as far as his approach to to um, transforming this mostly single line cello work into a lute suite. Of course, he adds basses, he fills out harmonies, he adds ornaments. It's it's quite a transformed piece. And it's not the only time he did something like that. He arranged the A minor violin sonata, also transposing into fifth. He arranged that for keyboard. It's a magnificent transcription, really, really interesting uh, transcription. And he arranged all the violin concertos for keyboard, those he transposed down a step. And he famously transcribed the E major prelude originally for violin is it? He puts that in D major uh, and, and gives it to the organ. Right, so he's he's not above taking his own music or anybody else's music and arranging it, transforming it. This is the real Baroque way. Um, I think the, the most fascinating transformation is that transformation in the Cantata 29 of the E major violin uh, prelude, where he gives basically the right hand of the organ, the violin part, puts a bass under it, but he adds as well strings, timpani, trumpets. You know, it's, it's, it's a glorious reimagination of the piece. So although in, when Segovia started to play Bach on the guitar, this was oh, you know, almost, almost looked at as a heresy, we now, uh, with what we know of uh, you know, from musicology and from studying the Baroque sources, we now know that, in fact, um, you know, that this was absolutely something Bach did, maybe sometimes under duress, as when he, he used the, the third Brandenburg concerto opening, he used that in a cantata, he used the harpsichord concerto first movement in a cantata, and he used the, uh, the uh, of course, the E major prelude, putting it into D major, also in the cantata 29. Okay, so the trans transmigration of Bach's music in his own oeuvre is really interesting. And sometimes he even does paraphrases like the Sarabande of the fifth cello suite, which is very is very much like the Et Incarnatus S from the B minor mass. Um, and sometimes I think that the words that he used in the cantatas, uh, the texts from the cantatas where he reused pre-existent material, uh, gives us a good clue to what he might have thought about the music. So I always want to ask Bach himself wherever, whenever that's possible. Just a very short sort of summary of some of those solo pieces. So 995 is the, is the arrangement of the, of the cello suite. 996 is this Lautenberg piece written for the lute harpsichord, which Bach had two of those lute harpsichords. You know, and he, 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 he loved that sound. And then 997, 998, it's a pair of pieces probably associated with the lute. 999 is, is, the, uh, is the little uh, uh, prelude. Which we know for the keyboard. That's 999. And uh, 1000 is... Is the violin fugue arranged... By, not by Bach, but by someone else for the lute. And then we start in with the six sonatas and partitas for violin, followed by the six cello suites. And then we have the flute partita in A minor, followed by the six sonatas for violin with the accompaniment of the, of the cembalo. So if you look at, that, at those uh, pieces, which are sort of three of them, three of them are sets of six, and then you've got a few isolated pieces like the, 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 the lute pieces, or so-called lute pieces and the flute partita. All the, that entire range of works, which is an astonishing gamut of works, gives you a context in which to understand any single work. So uh, you know you you are familiar with a lot of them, probably all of them, practically by by now by ear. And so when we come to look at a specific uh, couple of movements, uh, as we have right here, you know we can we can make reference back to to that. Now, the basis of all Baroque music is the general bass, or basso continuo. And particularly, I'm going to focus now on the almond, almond that you, you just played. Uh, this almond, even though it is, uh, you know, very free, we still have to have four beats in a measure. So sometimes you were losing the four beats in a measure, um, or the eight-eighth notes <laughs> in a measure. And this is very, very florid writing. I, I mean, Bach... 
I can't think of any Almond that's any more florid than this one. And it, it is so florid that amongst the cello suite sources, um, there are a couple that say, you know, molto adagio or something to that effect. Because to fit all the ornaments in, you just can't go, you know, too fast. Um, it's interesting that the that the violin sonatas are or are sort of organized in three sets of two, uh, three sonatas, three partitas, and the cello suites have all got the same form except for the penultimate movements, which are in suites one and two pairs of minuets, in suites three and four pairs of bourrées, and in, in suites five and six pairs of gavots. So basically. The cello suites are organized as three times two, and the violin sonatas and partitas are two times three, in the sense that there are, there are categories, there are three sonatas, three partitas, and the Bach cello suites we can kind of categorize according to the penultimate movements, which are paired. Um, so that's an interesting thing. Two times three is twice the trinity. Bach loved the number six. He, did, he has endless <laughs> sort of uh, sets of six, pieces, whether it's six organ trio sonatas, you know, six keyboard partitas, six French suites, six English suites, uh, on and on and on. He used that a lot. And obviously the Trinity idea and the two times three is very important. He also used uh, the number 24 a lot, but uh, not in this, not in the, in the number of measures in this almond. All right. I would like, I'm, our time is limited. I don't want to just be blabbing away all the time. But can we start, please, again with this Almond, and, and let's just start from the beginning of it. Let me, let me just take my two. Okay, please, again the, the Almond. Okay, let's play it again. You might have started. You Try and keep the rhythm, and you can, if you want, if you add it, you'll be for sure right rhythmically. On the guitar. I usually do this because it just gets me oriented. Once again. You're early on the C sharp. Right? B there, you know. I think it's good to kind of be to be correct on the on the eighth notes, kind of correct. If you want to start that a little earlier, it's okay because you have so many ornaments to play. As long as you sure. come out basically right on the quarters. Sure. Right, so now let's just look at that as if it was figured bass. So you have, then you have, so what he's doing is, is basically, right, over the, over sure. there. And this is, this is always what drives anything Bach does, always the basso continuo. And what, what, you know, and these are sort of improvised, uh, you know, figurations on top of it. Great. Let's go for go on from now. Uh, right. Is that from bar sure. bar two? Uh, Let's try to get the rhythm. Mm -hmm. Right. I didn't. I didn't. 
quite understand that. So we have. If you want, you can do a little ornament. You could add a third. You can count eighths if you have to, because this piece is so slow. You know. I I wouldn't try to be so fast with the G. Let let because you have seven six. So th that's where you want to take a bit more time. Well, I think, I th I th we want to hear the seven to six. That's what makes it beautiful, right? We had it. We had. We had another seven six earlier, and here's another. Really, what we should do in such a piece is play a simple version, a really, really simple version to understand what all the notes are are doing. Because this is, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a seventh chord, and there, and there's some notes. Right, so you understand what, what are the functional notes and what are the ornamental notes. Because sure. you understand, uh, so the main notes are going to be any, anything, this, the bass tells you what, what the function of the notes is. The G, a G is meaningless, because G could be this, G could be this, G could be this, G could be a million, a million things. In this case, it's passing, it connects. Okay, so just for clarification, you do, because uh, you're playing a D in the middle voice. No, I added uh, a D, yeah, right. And I put, uh, a, I put a more. Do you, re do you re articulate it, or do you hold over the previous D? Oh, Could oh, I added it. I re okay. You, okay, you re-articulate, got it. I mean, that's personal, but on the cello, that sounds much fuller than it does on the guitar. And sure, we know from so Vox practice what he did, you know, in the fifth suite, we can see that many times he added stuff. Now, he didn't always, right? When, when, he, when he came to the Saraband, he added very, very little. He left that very naked, right? But in the case of the Almond, he did a lot, right? He filled out chords. He, you know, made the harmonies fuller, uh, added ornaments, all that kind of stuff. Here, I don't know what one could add because it's so full. But I don't play the D very loud. But um, right. That's early. That's early. That's early thatch. You see, that's kind of a lot to throw in there because it comes out of something so florid. You know, in the Baroque time, they did ornament, but they also mocked people who ornamented too much. Or they, they mocked people, they say, whenever, anytime he has a finger free, he's sticking an ornament in. You know, the ornamentation, I love the Italian word, abbellimento. You know, it's supposed to make something more beautiful. Bello means beautiful, right? Un abbellimento, something makes it... If you, it, it, basically ornamentation is what you do when you sing in the shower, right? So it's because you love a note. Remember that vibrato was an ornament with its separate sign for it. In fact, in the Bach, in, in there's a, the violin sonata at the, at the end of the adagio of the A minor violin sonata, he, he has this sign which means ornamenting, which means vibrato going to, the A minor violin sonata. He, he actually uses the vibrato and then he has them. Right? So the vibrato was an ornament, you know? And then a, a slightly more fancy version of the vibrato is the trill where you start doing it even, you know, a bit wider variation, oscillation. So the ornaments were all to do with expression. And especially on pluck string instruments like ours, uh, repeated notes, as you know, 
mm-hmm. right? Our, our, all, all, a lot of our famous pieces use repeated notes because we don't have the bow, right? We don't have an air comma, we don't have a bow, so we need moving notes. And strangely enough, in this piece, which is almost more like a viola da gamba style piece, really, you know, uh, and it's it's you know very very florid. So, so let's let's go on. In there somewhere. Sure. Uh, Just the same thing. I get the rhythm right. Um, That's a little bit faster. What he writes. Right. Sure. So how do you reconcile um, when, because uh, you said earlier that you want to keep this element very much in time, but how do you, um, so like for this, if you're going to take more time, what I was trying to do is to uh, uh, give more time where you wanted to and then stay in time by accelerate. So how do you handle, um, uh, you know, of course, rubato's borrowed time. So when you borrow time, how do you give it back? Well, you you, you basically you basically are doing it. It just needs to be a little bit more more correct. Right? You you, sure. you got it exactly right. Rubato, and then you give back, but you you have to have a steady beat under it in some way, shape, or form. I think I don't like I don't like uh, baroque music where there's no where there's no understandable pulse. So you can bend. It's you know you, you can bend as long as you know where, where the pulse is. You don't necessarily have to be with the pulse, but the pulse I think should go, except for retardando it in a you know a cadence at a double bar or something like that. For the most part. Sure, sure that's right. Okay, now we. Do something to fill. There you have it. Play. Do whatever you want, but don't don't cheat that one, right? Because that's. Something like that. I don't think that was very effective. <laughs> I, don't I, I don't either. Uh, what just going around? That's great. You got the right idea, but 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 you know, try. And... Okay. So that would be. So. Um... Yeah, don't get mechanical with the trill. The trill is, you know, the French had a word for trill. They called tremblement. Why do you, why, in old English it was called shake. Purcell called them shakes. Why do you shake? Why do we shake? We shake when we weep. We shake when we're really angry or when we're very nervous or whatever. Why do we shake? So I always say, and this works in English, this pun, but it doesn't work in any other language. I always say it's a trill, not a drill. A drill, not, you're not making a hole in the wall, right? Certainly. <laughs> Sometimes I walk down the, halls of the conservatories and I hear especially the pianists are big sinners in, in, in the trills. They want some not the great pianists, but sometimes you hear the piano it just it just it drives me completely nuts. These absolutely, you know, percussive like a drill. Trill, you know, but the trill is is it's home It has to especially this you know, these these uh, ornaments are really Itali- Italianate ornament ornaments really. It's mixed with French because Bach mixed the two styles. You know, sure. it, again, if you want to understand the two styles, you go to the Clavier Ubon Part Two, and you listen to the Ouverture Al Francais Chaud in B minor, and the Italian Concerto in F major. But there's a reason he stuck them in F major and B minor because there couldn't be anything further apart than a tritone, right? So the Italian Concerto is very sunny F major. The Ouverture Al Francais Chaud. But if you want to see ornaments, go look at that. You know, the, sure. it's, it's it's eleven movements, and the Italian Concerto is three movements. Three plus eleven, of course, gives you fourteen, and that's the Bach number, with B being two, A being one, C being three, and H being eight. So those numbers, when you add them up, the in terms of the order in the alphabet, that gives you the number fourteen. So he played with that number fourteen a lot, you know. 
Um, the D minor violin partita that ends with the chacona has four movements before it, which you play, right? It has four plus one, so it's backwards, 41. Okay, so when you have this trail on... Yeah, you know, you're doing your... Doing. This kind of a trill, which we'll see a lot in the Paganini Caprice coming up. But um, I wouldn't get into the... I don't think it has to be that kind of a trill. It's a right hand thing, you know. The trill you did is P-A-I-M, -P I believe. Am I right? right. I would do P-A-I-A-I-A-A. -A -A -A. For those who are not guitarists listening in, we use these Spanish abbreviations for our right hand fingers. P is pulgar, indice medio anular. So P I M A. So when we speak about right hand trill, I, you, you've seen me do this. A I A I, and then with you add you do A A at the end. Yeah, just lighten up at the end. You hardly touch it. Just caress it. Light, less lighter. Light, light, caress it. Fine, fine. You, 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 uh, you'll get this. There's nothing we have to work, work on a lot. Let's go on. Sorry, I'm losing. Um... Okay, so when he goes up here, catch when he goes here. You know, when he goes, you know it's he goes up a, to a higher register. It could be a little bit more dramatic, perhaps. Sure. I, I don't. I wouldn't add the chord. I, I think it's not because going to, he doesn't. He doesn't. It's a little bit more. Just keep working. The chord. So in in figure boys, in figure boys, figure the bass. We go B. Um, right. Um, we want to justify any any note we add. We it has to make sense horizontally as a line. So we're not going to go. We're not going to go. Uh, you know, right? Because that's not beautiful. We have to connect it. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. But we. I think it's nicer like that to put the the, the weight of the extra notes on the downbeat. Sure. It's a, it's a question of artesian. This is not strong. The A or A, the D, the E is stronger because it's slightly dissonant. It's right. The harmony here is this. It's, so it's so the F sharp wouldn't be stronger, but rather the A, the E. Because the E is, is dissonant with the harmony. Now here's another place it would be nice to have a little, uh, you know. You could do a little ornament in there, it would be nice. Um. Alright, I did this. La Sol. Also, uh, the ornaments must be very uh, caressing. Well, not, oh, too not fast. Too fast catch, not too percussive. Because when B, 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 B minor, very, you know, in a very different feel from, har from the har point of view of harmony. I think you could be more lyrical. 
Not too percussive. I would like more, more, more expressive. Not too, not too percussive. Not too romantic. <laughs> right, just right in the middle. Perfect. It's subtle. Just, just a, don't, don't overdo it. Don't underdo it. Of course, this is the, this is why we have to work so many thousands of hours, right? We're trying to hit this golden mean, uh, and it's hard to do it. That it seems to be. So I did this, right? Slur, slur, slur off, and hammer on. Right. More feeling, not them. Right. More tragic. Tremblement, tremblement, tremblement. Trembling with emotion. That's too, it's, it's too mechanical sounding. Needs to sigh more. I think it's too many repercussions. Just simple. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. I don't like the Nachschlag. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of Nachschlags, but nothing. It makes it too important. It's not sure. that important. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh... Let's go. No, that's too fast. These are apocituras. It's the basic line is that he goes in apocitura, apocitura. No. Not too much. This you, if you want, you can do what the French call a coulée. Fill it up. So we're bar five. Can you hold the E? Perfect. Nice.
I'm not a great fan of that trill. <laughs> I think, um, you know, when, when you have, when you have, you have this stuff, uh, if you want, would be better, big, long, right? Because on the guitar, this sounds a little empty. The cello has the bow and they can do whatever they want, you know. Just noodling around there, right? He's just he's just noodling. So he does all in under under pedal. If you those are the harmonies that he. It's just a postlude, you know, a, 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 a final comment. All right. So I've been a real pain in pain in the neck to you today, but I do that because I think you're great. You know, I think you're great and you're wonderful. And you will fix. You will fix everything but these are really these are sort of very fundamental things that in a in, a, in an unknown that's as florid as this one is you've got to be quite careful uh about not getting lost in in you know with with all the ornaments sure right? and and the ornaments however are are not are not written to be played mechanically but rather um are there to 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 be abelimenti you know to make something more beautiful you know? and so if you, if you if you want to understand what's going on Always orient yourself from the bass upwards. What would what would the numbers be for the basso continuo? So in in this end thing, it would be seven six raise seven to nothing, right? Because they don't show the the the, the, the tonic stuff, right? And and when you when you've got stuff like uh, let's see. Uh, um, That's what's going on, right? You have this 642, which he loves. Right. A little postlude. Right. Certainly. So that that's that's what you want to do i made i made um, a a, a basso continuo sketch which which i'll i'll, I'll send to you and and right. and and uh you know then then you you'll see i mean there there are places one could one could debate you know because it's not always crystal clear but bach always has the basso continuo uh as as a basis and you can see that in the fact well the piece we did just a, uh, in our, in our individual work just a little while ago View. Of course, the, the few subject. This is Bach. Uh, this is nine nine eight. Probably if you're going to leg originally in E flat major. Um, very interesting piece that he wrote. And the fugue subject. And the answer. So he doesn't. He doesn't literally transpose the answer. In fact, he, that's pretty wild, right? You would get thrown out of uh, out of counterpoint class for writing that that exposed tritone. But Bach, of course, makes a, makes a genius. Uh, we'll see in the fugue that that uh, that uh, uh, that young Helen's going to play the C major fugue. He does the same thing. He alters the answer and put and sticks a third in there, right? So what I'm getting at is that it's always the harmonic principle that that dominates. He will make he will make changes sometimes to the literal transposition of a theme in or of a fugue theme, let's say, in order to accommodate the the harmonic principle of of, of the basso continuo that's dictated by the basso continuo rules. So um, that's you know that's a very very important thing. And he would start his students off playing basso continuo, you know, and they'd be there trying to figure out all these you know masses of numbers and thing uh, that that he wrote you know his basso continuos are packed with numbers because he's always using suspensions and that makes the numbers pile up and they said bach would come over and start sticking his fingers in in the keyboard adding stuff all the time you know? so he and, and this is this is the astonishing thing um uh, if, if you the, the the way the disparate way that he resolves contrapuntal voices 
Uh, and so the idea that of the idea of a of a you know of a one line Bach piece is completely ridiculous because he may give you one note at once, but it, then it's four voices, right? If he or or. Right? <laughs> He's always, you know, he's giving, he, it's it just, he spread the counterpoint out. Um, and he does a counterpoint in, in, or he does a fugue theme, right? And, and, with two voices. And like. So, that's the, also present here. Uh, in, 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 in this very florid almond. So I think the prelude made incredible progress since the last time I heard it. I mean, it was, it, you did some astonishing things also with the echo effects, it was just great. Um, and I'll look forward to working on that uh, a little, little more as, as our work at NEC proceeds. But really, you did a marvelous job to sit down, play that in the morning in front of a microphone, uh, with that degree of aplomb and, and, and self-confidence and musicality was absolutely terrific. And you know, I'm only, I'm only, I'm only tough on you because I love you and I, and I, and I know you can do anything. So you'll, that's very kind of you, professor. You'll forgive, you'll forgive me for that. I will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's Thank you so much. You so much. <laughs> Bravo as always. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take a one minute break here and then uh, Carmine Catalano is going to perform for us the sixth caprice of Paganini. Carmine, if you're, if you're there, please sign in. Okay, I'll be, I'll be back in just one minute. Ok, fammi sapere dove stai. I'll come to you. Okay. We're a European tuning. 442 eh? Uh, 440. 440? <laughs> Then we were flat. So for the non-guitarists out there, in the sixth suite of Bach, we tuned our sixth, sixth string scordatura down a step to have the low D. But for this piece, by Paganini, we go back to normal tuning. Fammi sapere, fammi sentire ancora. to be in tune with you at least. Okay. Please. Thank you. 
Yeah, bravissimo. I think you did a wonderful job with this very difficult piece. Uh, I, I really only have one major comment, which has to do with how you come out of the tremolando. So when you have... Let me see if I can get this. You can see my right hand. Like, when you do some... There's like this little gap sometimes. Yeah. You have to disguise that, you know. You don't want, you don't want to, you want to have it. Your rhythm is absolutely right. But the very end of the, of the tremolando. And you can get around it by faking a little bit. So if you do, you do, you see, you can do already the thumb prayer prepares. Listen, so as you see, I, 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 and you can do portamenti also. On, This way you disguise it, right? We talked about this. But we don't want the break at the very end of... Yeah. The, yeah, the trim along. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm even... Any more misterioso. And then... This is like the bird beating its wings, you know, like a... <laughs> this is under the moonlight, you know, it's like, it's like a... He wrote a lot of pieces that have that, that moonlight feeling to them. Right, so it, it, this is like... Right? It's, it has that feel, like the famous sonata that we guitarists know, which is the Siciliana, actually. This is not Siciliana, but... Uh, but if you... How many times he uses six chord? Se tre, right? Sesta, sesta. He always is using this six, you know, this thing. Castanova use it also a lot. It parallels six three chord, you know, first inversion chord. That's a lot of that here. Not right, right here, but here they come just three in a row, right? Six chords, sixth chord, six first inversion. Now, here with Paul Pastrella, we use the flesh of the thumb, which has a different, not the nail, but we use the, the flesh part here. The thumb has different sound than the fingernail. So you must just, you know, you, on fiddle, they're doing this. Of course, they're doing a... Uh... <laughs> this is impossible on the guitar. So when I, when I trans first transcribed this piece, you know, 30, 40 years ago, I had to invent a new technique of, of doing trills, right-hand trills, this hand, I mean, the trill, instead of... Uh... And it was, just wasn't going to sound right, so I had to... You know, as much, always when we have a repeated note, you know, it's a... Of course, not in this key. My, my wonderful friend and colleague, Ruggio Ricci, used to play it on the fiddle. Recuerdos. <laughs> he played in this one. 
We played. Of course. So this is. Paganini would have done that, you know, who knows. <laughs> but for now, I, I, this has, you know, this a nice elegance to it. And as you know, in the, when Berio wrote the sequenza for me, and he has a, you know, we have, we have this all through this, the, the guitar sequence. These weird burial harmonies, right? But but he used this technique. I when I when I when I met him, I said, you know, Meister, I can do this all day, so you know it doesn't matter. You know, you can write whatever you want. And it's for this this piece taught me how to do it. Right? You, you make sure that it's always alive. This tremolando is the beating heart of a of a dove. Bird, bird hearts beat very fast and beat like this, you know, 400 times a minute or something. So this is like the beating heart of a bird, this tremolando. Bate and cuore. Yeah, sure. Okay, don't, no nail in this sound. Thumb flesh, not this. This is our nail sound. It was a very beautiful sound. But this, this is misterioso. We have the uh, augmented second. You're going to move the right hand. And you do things like that, right? <laughs> Let's look at this. So I don't, I don't want any break. Also, the left hand. Oh, you watch the left hand. You see, it starts to move. If you take more liberty, it will be more interesting. Okay. So. Move the right hand more. Don't just stay, don't just stay here. You're, watch my right hand. Not always here. Move it. Polpastrella. 
to our comfort. We must imitate what the violin does in this case. We can do this, right? Then we have the, the, the C naturale, C in bemol. Also, you new game. Mi bemol maggiore. E flat major. You know, that's a beautiful modulation all of a sudden. Right in there. We have to get rid of this, this gap. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You have to get just to the next bass note a little early. You can break it. It doesn't have to be vertical, you know? Okay. You see, okay, I've, okay. I, 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 faccio un po' di inganno, right? Don't wait, though. Just do this. Yeah, you can get to the end, you can do whatever you want, look. Sempre, sempre così, sempre così, sempre così, always. Okay. And you have time. Perfect. 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 But don't, don't, try not to wait. You know, you have to get back with the thumb. Okay. And get these together, yeah? And here, this change makes me always. <laughs> yeah, I see. Always, I'm always fear. Yeah. I'm also afraid of this change because I couldn't find a way to to let uh, the chord sound. Well, exactly. Like where, where is that? Where is that? That's good. Mm -hmm. From here. Uh, then. Ah. Uh, You have to, you have to, you have to lie, lie like a professional politician that I won't name. You see, just get there. And technique is the motion between two points. Okay, so this is the technique. This is, you don't even see it, you don't even, you only hear the result of it. But the technique is actually this. This is the technique. You see, three has to do this, right? That's the technique. The technique's not this. No, the technique is how do I get there? So... You see? This. Just get to that. Don't worry about this. Don't get this. Don't worry about 4 1. That's how I cover it up. You wait. You do. The, you finish this, and then you start. But I do. This. That's all. But then you. Then you disappear. Okay. You have to get the last D that you play has to immediately have this G. Then you're okay. No, don't wait. The D to the G fast. Don't wait. Don't, no, no, no. Don't, Don't accent the last note. Don't accent the last note. Don't accent. Don't accent it. Diminuendo. You hear the difference? You do this. Wait. You see what I'm doing? Yeah. No. 
The other thing I do is I do a slight accelerando in the tremolando. So I have time. I steal time at the end of the tremolando. The last two notes are almost like a chord or like a third, right? See how close? Same thing always. And I covered up. Many ways I cover up. Portamento, arpeggiando, getting. But I have. Right? I, you can practice this piece like. That's how you have to practice. going to die on us. So what I do is, first I bring, then I bring the, what I do with the dynamic to give the illusion that the D is lasting. This is a very important point. Watch this. Let me know when you're You see? While the D dies, I accompany. Now I bring it back up. And that keeps the D in the ear of the listener. It's like in Villa Lobos. Chopin works like this on the piano. You know, it has the melody and then he does arpeggios and fancy stuff. That's the same with his, his Pagani. I have many tricks, but this is a big one. But don't do the same trick twice. Otherwise, people can tell what you're doing. You have to have a lot of variety of tricks. Like a good magician, you know. And play by ear. This is something you almost, you can't really do it. I could tell you physically how to do it. And I did just tell you physically how to do it. But it's not really going to help unless you have the... This is what... Yeah, then, let's see. Uh, uh, just look at the end. You can fill the chord out. Play four voices. Right? Then of all is quattro voci. Here. this at the oh. end. The very end of the piece. Beautiful. You did a terrific job with this very, very difficult piece. The only thing you must watch the end, uh, the transition between each harmony to the next. That's the only thing. Everything and, and use, you know, all the tricks that I showed you. The arpeggio, the arpeggio, sometimes it's arpeggio, sometimes you add a note, sometimes you fill the chord out, sometimes, sometimes it's... Right, that's one. The portamento. It's so much more beautiful. This is cold. Right. Sometimes this. All 
this kind of stuff. Okay. But you did a terrific job with this piece. And I see that your hand doesn't get tired at all. So that's beautiful. Almost. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> it's We're terrific. Still working on it. Terrific work. Wonderful. Really great. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Rimaniamo sempre in contatto. Okay, mi raccomando. Sì, sì, sì. Assolutamente. Okay, grazie. Grazie, Mr. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Young, are you out there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. I'm going to take another one minute break. I just have to check on something here and, uh, and I'll be right back. And with, then we, okay. we, we start maybe a little bit of, I don't know. Do you have, uh, what do you want to play? The Fugue or the, or the Adagio or what do you want to play? Both. Uh, I play, uh, I play uh, Fugue today. Just the Fugue? Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. I'll be right back. Okay, please. Let me let, let's see if we are in tune because you often you do tune high. So let me see where you are. We were just here. Do you hear me? Oh boy. Young, are you there? Oh, he throws. Young. Young, are you there? Carolyn, are you there? Yes, Professor Fisk. I'm going to message him and see if I can figure yeah. it out. It might be he has a little delay in his connection, but I'm going to message him. Okay, for me, he's frozen. He'll probably come back in now. Um, Professor Fisk, while we're waiting um, for on, I know you said you had to develop a new technique. Oh, I had a brilliant question. Maybe I'll save it for later because just, we just got him back. Excellent. Okay. Hello. Sorry. Uh, my laptop was gone. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah it's, I'm glad we got you back. That's the good news. Okay, so please go ahead. So we lost you again.
He's, he's signing in from Korea, so we have a... Carolyn, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, I can. Okay. Do we have a, a time limit or can I go a little over, a little past noon? Oh, absolutely. Uh, considering this, you can go past noon. Nothing's going to stop or shut off. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Of course. Of course. Um, on, if you need tech assistance, you can also send me a message in the chat if um, something is happening with the connection. Young, are you there? Hmm. Of course, we only have the problem now when it's <laughs> a master class. Our lessons were fine. Okay, we try again. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Uh... It isn't, it isn't, it's not my uh, laptop, so yeah, I can't do it again by my phone. Okay, can you can you put your, your computer so we can see you a little bit better? I only see your face now. I, I need to see your hands. Okay. Sorry. I could see both. Can you see? I need to see both hands if that's possible. Okay. Yeah, I think you maybe. Uh, yeah, that's better. I mostly can see both hands. You, 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 can you make? I don't know. That's better. Uh, sorry, I don't know why uh, my computer is not working. Okay, well maybe we won't try maybe we won't try to do the whole fugue all the way th through. We'll we'll maybe look at the exposition and maybe one of the episodes or something. You know, just play perhaps play through the exposition for now and we'll we'll keep working from there. Thank you. 
I'm going to interrupt there, but you're playing so beautifully, but the connection is bad. We're not hearing all the beautiful things that you're that you're doing, but it sounds very, very good. Uh, I like the tempo. I like the transcription and the fingerings. Very, very good. Very, very good. I, I'm, I'm so sorry that the, we have bad reception today. I don't know why we've done so many lessons from Korea. We never had bad reception, but today we don't have good reception. So I will do my best. Cool. and get this guitar in tune. So we have this wonderful fugue. And he does this a lot in, 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 the, uh, in the fugues, that there's sort of two parts to it. There's sort of like an opening. And then kind of an answer. Again, you know he doesn't do he doesn't do the lit the literal thing. He doesn't do that, right? He he doesn't. It's quite a change. This is totally tonal, but there's. This is actually, is this the uh, Yeah, this is a, this is, this is almost Bach's name right there, right? But, mm. so when he does this, when he answers, you know, he writes out all these half notes in the in the in the in the bass line that the violin would have some difficulty maybe holding these are some very weird harmonies you know Bach will always do this I mean that is just totally nuts it's an augmented fourth it's right 
Bach is known for his chromaticism, right? He, 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 he's always squeezing out so much meaning in a small, you know, small space. The, 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 when these works were rediscovered, these solo violin pieces, I mean, the, the 19th, the, eight, the people in the, in the 1800s who knew of them, such as Schumann, you know, when Schumann heard these played, he went running to the piano to accompany them. In fact, Schumann, Schumann even uh, wrote piano accompaniments to all the sonatas and partitas. And he wrote piano accompaniments to all the violin caprices of Paganini as well. Very, very interesting. So in a way, it's very, it's very uh, appropriate to mix these two big monuments in the solo violin repertoire, the sonatas and partitas with Paganini caprices, which we just had Paganini caprices, right? So... Um, these two geniuses, Bach and Paganini, were 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 capable of, of bringing out of the solo violin things that nobody could could imagine, you know, and uh, of course Bach even more uh, uh, impressively in a way. So when we when we play this on the guitar, you know. passing dissonances that distances we talked about this before when we worked on the piece that when when we when we when 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 i practice this for myself i i often i practice this to hear all the he wrote all those notes to sound that way remember bach wrote a lot of music for chorus and if the, those voices are sung you will really hear the dissonances uh you know you really hear the sound of the dissonances very clearly so in the guitar, of course, we, we, we don't have the capacity to sustain, so we have to do it with our ear. We have to be... That's pretty weird. Right? Once, once more from the from the beginning. Let's 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 hear it. Yes. Uh, I'm so sorry, my connection and sound quality because uh, I can't use my computer now. I don't know why the reason. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. Make the best out of it. Maybe it would be better to use different fingering. Keep this on the fourth string instead of. I think you did better. Right, better here. You know, Bach has it. These are. This is the figured bass, right? The harmony is he, when he does. Uh, so it, it's it's a and then the first inversion, first inversion. So it's it's interesting. Major, minor, major, minor. But it's, again, it's this it's these parallel six chords. Sustain that would be great. Right. 
I do. You see, with the bar here, so I have the first finger to play two notes. Can you reach this? Or even, it's better than, otherwise you do this. But this is, is better if possible. Do you see what I'm doing? Can you see? Yeah. To sustain, to sustain. Good. So that, remember this, this is major, this is minor. Major. Right. Right, but this is the difference between happiness and sadness. Right? And this could this could this could take you to could take you to, to F major. This, this is look, young, young, this is two five one in F, right? But he doesn't he doesn't It's a dominant. It's a secondary dominant to to F. And then deceptive cadence. So he does. He doesn't do. He doesn't. He doesn't. But in the, you see the incredible harmonic subtlety, right? He could have, but he is. You see the difference. That's what. Much sadder. Can you hear that? Can you hear yes, that? Yes, I can hear. Yeah. Okay. Right. So these are the things that, that we can do on the guitar in terms of color. Bach's harmonic sense is just absolutely astonishing. You know, it's very D minor. This could be one. It should go to D minor, but but he goes. Look at all these different colors. Can you hear the difference in the colors? This goes to G major, right? G major, but then all of a sudden F major. But the, I just the deceptive cadence. Does this should go? But he goes. Uh, it's like, right? It's like a deceptive cadence, but even more subtle. What a beautiful, it's a very old kind of modal sound, you know, not, doesn't sound so tonal as modal. So we must always be sensitive to these incredible, subtle harmonic motions that Bach has. Okay, great. Let's go on. Watch out. Awesome. This should go here. That should go to C, buddy. Again, he uses a distinctive cadence, right? Because this is... Should take you to C, but he doesn't want to go there, so... You see how much sadder this is if he... If he harmonized like that, but... So... Now we're in D minor. You see, Bach gives us so many different feelings in the space of, of a couple of seconds. Do you understand what I'm saying? If he had yeah. done nothing wrong with that, the voice leading is perfectly fine, but he has Right? So we don't want to play. But maybe a little softer. You understand? Because of the harmony. 
Yeah. You know what a deceptive cadence is? This would be like Right? This is a deceptive cadence. Right? Instead of going five seven one, we go five seven six. Very different feeling if you do G seven C button A minor. Let's go on. Any place in there. Can you sustain? Can you see it? Sustain. This is the counter subject. Sharp. Hold the G sharp. Have an entrance. Major. This comes down, but the 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 F sharp brings you to G major. This is G minor, right? This is G minor, but here G major, G minor, right? Of, uh, of right mm -hmm. um, of four all these different colors fine right, let's go farm Articulation. Right. Right. From here. Wait, wait, wait. It doesn't start. It doesn't start on this. It starts here. This is an ending. It starts here. Right? The phrase does not start on the downbeat. It starts right after. Oh, play the major chord. That's the four. Start on the G. Beat it up. Beep up. Start on the sixteenth notes. No, don't play that now. Start here. Articulation, articulation. Don't 
Strong harmony. From there. Very powerful harmony, right? Look at that. Don't just play through it, right? This is a pedal point chord. You know. Then he does, he does. Uh, one, three, five, one, three, five, augmented, seven, nine, eleven. That's amazing. One, the, right? The third, the fifth augmented, the seventh, the ninth, the eleventh. The very strong. Now, one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. And the, it's, of course, in the, in, the, in the scheme of things, it's. Which is preparing A minor, right? Now, yeah.
when he goes into fewer voices. <laughs> Beautiful there. Not too loud. You have to hear this. We don't you know make sure that this middle voice is very clear. That otherwise it doesn't make sense when all of a sudden it's all alone, you know? You know what I'm saying? Can you hear the middle voice? You know what I'm That's where that comes from. You understand? So we want to hear the middle voice. Do you hear it? Yes, I can hear. Counterpoint. Okay, from here. Move your right hand. Don't be stuck here all the time. From there again. Diminuendo, diminuendo, diminuendo. You're playing all the same but dynamic. Come down. No, this one. Way after that. Way after that. That's it. Here. Can you find that? Okay. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. No, piano, piano, piano. Look, when Bach goes, when Bach fights rights for the violin in four voices, it's loud. When he go, when he, when he's fighting for one voice, it's gonna be piano again. More, 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 more. Dolce. Right. 
Muy dulce, muy dulce. No, 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 Sustain. Right. Let's just do the end of it. The most wonderful part over the pedal. Yes. Right from. It's right from here. Here, Dolce. Now, crescendo. Oh, yeah, that's all right. Once again, from there. Right there. Not too loud, not too loud, not too loud. This is Dolce still. Right. And this, and then when he gets, when he finally gets there. to know who the first voice is right anyway you sound very very good you have wonderful feeling i would like to have more variety of of dynamic and color more crescendo diminuendo and more feeling for the subtle harmonies the the difference in the chromatic pitches but basically it's very 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 well done it's very you have a very elegant way of doing it i like it very much thank you we will continue working on this it's a wonderful piece for the guitar you know it really it's it's much uh, <clears throat> more idi idiomatic for the guitar i think than the violin this yeah. piece. okay terrific thank you. Yeah. thank you so much thank you so much okay okay any closing remarks or questions or anything yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> Um, well, I, I also invite our guitarist to ask any questions of you, Professor Fisk, but I was actually really curious about something. You mentioned earlier in the class that you had to adapt a new technique you said you created for a transcription. Yeah, was and for the I'm... Paganini. It had to do with uh, make, doing a trill, because trill on the guitar, 
most guitar trills, when I started playing the guitar, we, we thought of a trill as, which is done with the left hand by itself, like this, which is a very delicate kind of a trill. But when I got interested in Baroque music, and I started listening to the harpsichordists, and then I became the last direct pupil of the great Ralph Kirkpatrick, a musicologist, harpsichordist, incredible genius. And uh, there I sort of expanded the spectrum of trills. So I, we learned to do what we call cross-string trills, which is, which is actually plucking the notes instead of, instead of this is a typical trill that we might do, or with one finger or with two trill, with two fingers, where we're hammer on, pull off, hammer on, it's, you know, this is a typical trill, or, or a, a, you know, a shorter version of it. Well, when I started listening to the harpsichord players, <clears throat> I, I soon, I developed different, different kinds, different, not right hand, what we call right hand trill, because the both fingers are, you know, this is holding a position, and this is, there are many ways, Depending on, if you want more of an accent, you might use the thumb in there. So and then, then this is a continuous trill, which I had to... The only way to do this on the guitar was to, 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 to have a fixed position here and to do the trill with the right hand, actually plucking the notes instead of... Instead of it's just not going to sound, it's not loud enough. And it's hopeless to do this piece with left hand trills, no way. Especially you get up here, you know. I no, no possible way you could do it. So I invented this this technique. And now everybody does it, you know, it's nothing special. But forty years ago nobody was doing it at all. And then, or they would do it maybe two fingers. But this was very, very useful. The thumb, the ring, and this alternating of fingers made, made it very easy to do it. That's, that's where that came from. But now everybody does it. You know, it just at the beginning, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't have any teacher to tell me how to do it. So I had to, and I wanted to play the Paganini. I started, I said, well, I know I can play 24th Caprice because John Williams had played the 24th Caprice brilliantly on the guitar. I said, well, let, let's see about the other 23. And at first I thought, well, these cannot possibly be done. And then I kept working and working and I figured out a way actually to do all 24 and I recorded them many, many years ago. But, uh, my students play occasionally one or another of them, but uh, I only had one disciple that ever played all the tw all the twenty four. But um, you, you know, it's it's ferociously hard because so many of them are in E flat major, which is a terrible key for the guitar. You have five in E flat major, and they're they're all hard on the guitar because you, they just uh, you know open strings and stuff. But uh, some of them, you know, were really more guitar than like. on the guitar for sure or this one 12 this kind of thing or even you know, so I again I had to invent a new arpeggio because I usually we would that would be a typical guitar arpeggio, but he actually writes more notes. He writes, doesn't write triplets, but four notes. In. So I had to do a very uh, crossing the fingers going up in order. See, we like to do the fingers in this order or this order, but this the only way to get that effect. It's actually tricky because you know you have to skip the fingers across the string. It's complicated. And um, the other thing, the violinists play this like it starts on the, on downbeat, but it starts with a pickup. It's actually this is the tune. That's the downbeat. So it's in two four. One two one two. So I did things also in the left hand to. Right. I start with three two and then I end up with three four. To give the effect. Upbeat. 
on the guitar the fingering is so incredibly important it's it's orchestration and choreography at the same time there's no there's no instrument that is more crazy sensitive to fingering than the guitar it's it's it, you can play for one thing you can play you play the same note on six it, that's seven seven ways eight ways nine ways to play one note on the guitar so that means like you have nine possible orchestrations anytime that note comes up a lot of other notes also can be played many many different ways it's it, the guitar has all the difficulties of all the instruments in one place <laughs> it's just, it's just it. Even down to the difficulties of the oboe players making their and bassoon players making their reeds because we have to take care of our fingernails, which are, and, and each one of them is different. Each finger is it's just it's just a, but it's a fascinating instrument. And I, I what I was trying to do today was show, you know, some of the <clears throat> some of the avenues that you can go down. And that's just a, we really just did Bach and Paganini, but there are so many other composers whose music we you know, I, I did many 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 Scarlatti sonatas. And of course, all the Spanish piano masters like Albéniz and Granados. Uh, and then right up to the present day, I stole a lot of solo violin repertoire. I play all the uh, Caprice variations of George Rochberg, who also wrote a lot of guitar music for me. There are 51 variations on the 24th Caprice. Uh, I made a whole CD of them. It was like 78 minutes, you know. It's much better on the guitar than the fiddle, really, I think. But I had to recompose a lot. But I was very, very close to George Rochberg, very, very close. And uh, he he was he could be a real stickler, but he loved the, the the version that I made of them. Fortunately, I did the same with John Corigliano with the red violin caprices. I stole those. I stole a, a violin sonata by Cristobal Halfter, a very dissonant modern piece, which again I think much the violinists themselves are telling me it sound much better on the guitar. So uh, the guitar and the violin are 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 very interesting uh, members in the way of the same family. Of course, Paganini was a great guitarist, an unbelievable guitarist, and he he wrote stuff that no none of the guitar virtuosos figured out. He writes this is one place he writes. Let's see. I mean, those are weird harmonics. How would he figure this out? You know, it's just astounding. And he did the same thing here. That one, okay, you understand, but this one is, who would think of that, you know, crazy. See, he was just a phenomenal genius. And a lot of his violin writing, you know, comes from the guitar, like. The ninth Caprice, this is guitar writing, you know, he, he didn't learn that from the fiddle, that's for sure. And then he tells you to imitate the flutes and imitate the horns. Well, that's guitar, that's a guitar thing. And he played the guitar very, very well. I wrote a lot of chamber music with it. Mostly guitar just doing um papa accompaniment to the violin going crazy, but also some very demanding pieces for the guitar. And a couple of duos with the guitar and violin. There's one where the guitar has all the notes and the violin is accompanying the guitar. Very funny, very funny piece. And then he wrote a trio with cello, viola, guitar, violin, viola, uh, violin cello, guitar, um, and a bunch of guitar quartets where the guitar mostly doesn't have that much to do. The violin is all over the place. Anyway, and there's one, of course, the the viola steals the show. It's basically it's a quartet, but the viola. So you know he was playing the viola, or he was playing the, the violin, or he was playing, or he was playing the the guitar at times. You know, must have been because it, the the stuff is just astounding. So that's that. Well, it's all incredibly fascinating, and I feel like I just learned a lot about Paganini. I wasn't immediately aware of. And I love what you said about the harmonics. It reminds me of times when we're practicing really late at night and we're getting kind of sleep deprived, but then we just kind of fool around and we, we discover a new sound, you know, it's yeah. a, a late evening by candlelight or something. Right. Sure. House of Paganini. <laughs> right. Be very appropriate. Excellent. And I loved what you shared again about making your own techniques because I feel like transcription is starting to become even more and more popular as people yeah. are more advanced on their instruments and they realize the capabilities. Because I don't think a lot of people outside of classical music realize um, virtuosic 200 years ago is a lot was a different different definition, not to demean it or belittle it in any way, but people have just had more time with this instrumental technology to learn more things. Sure. I love how 
it is courageous in a way what you did to make a new technique something that not a lot of people know and could be seen as different but you got the sound you wanted to imitate another instrument so i think that's very encouraging for our, our younger students who might want to transcribe you know and to not be afraid to think out of the box Definitely. well that's been my entire life in music i mean that's that's all i've that's all i've done i mean um, and, and and as i i start to outline you know i have i have actually transcribed and performed all of Bach from 995 to 1019, all those works in one way, shape or form. So I, all the lute works, all the violin works, all the cello works, the solo flute partita I transcribed, but I haven't performed it yet, but I will one day. And then I did all the accompanied violin sonatas with the cello playing the left hand, basically, and, and, and the violin on top. And then sometimes I even played the violin part with the cembalo playing the cembalo part, like the E major sonata I, I took, the, I played the, the violin part. Or, or of course the arpeggione, which is a big cello piece, you know, it's, it's a, obviously it's a bowed guitar. I've played both parts there. Sometimes I play the top with the, with the keyboard, and sometimes I play the, the bottom. And actually the, the arpeggione part is actually more idiomatic than, than uh, than the, trying to adapt the piano part. We can adapt the piano part, but it's very, very complicated. You have to take out a lot of notes and stuff. Um, but I played once with uh, with a harpsichord, actually. It sounded amazingly good, <laughs> the Arpeggiani Sonata, played with John Gibbons, uh, who was on the NEC faculty for many years. So, And also a couple times with piano, I played it. This, it's, you know, but, but some of this stuff... Uh, uh, I want to say... What is that thing in the, uh, in the in the I'm forgetting it anyway. The the I I I did work on the on the on the top part of the arpeggio, which was very challenging. You know, some of these arpeggios. I don't know how the cellist can play. Is you know, some play it so very well. It's 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 amazing. Anyway. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Professor Fisk, and thank you all out there who are watching and those of you who might be seeing this after the fact because again all of our talks are available on the high peaks youtube channel you can get there by searching close encounters with music on youtube you can also search elliot fisk guitar Masterclass, and you'll immediately get to this video which is also being recorded so thank you so much to thank you we'll see you soon Yes, and bravi to our guitar students, Thatcher, Carmine, and Ahn, who we had three countries represented today. We had three continents. And three continents, exactly. The US, Italy, and South Korea. So beautiful playing by all. And tonight we have a Moonlight Sonata concert and those are all available again on the close encounters with music youtube channel and those concerts are happening tonight sunday evening and monday evening so three chances to see performances by our faculty and incredibly dedicated students so thank you all so much again and we'll see you for a future talk tomorrow is our last master class of the festival Colin Carr will be giving a cello master class, not to be missed. That is tomorrow, also at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And have a wonderful day.